Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, wherever you are in the world. Um, it is a pleasure to kick off this session today, the Industry Day of the Race to Zero Dialogues. My name uh, is Anthony Hobley, and I am the director of the Mission Possible platform, a collaboration of the World Economic Forum and the Energy Transitions Commission. It is a pleasure for the forum to co-host today's session with the International Trade Unions Confederation and, and with the COP Champions team. The session is part of the forum's climate action drumbeat in the lead up to COP26. Today, with just about 12 months to go to Glasgow, we must all step up our commitments and make sure that we turn commitments into action and collaboration. That's what we call at the forum, the three A's, strategy, ambition, action, and alignment to deliver a net zero climate aligned global economy. The industry day of the race to zero is just about that. It's about bringing together heavy, industry, consumer industry, government, civil society to mobilize concrete action and to accelerate the net zero industry transition. We must all do our part to support the healthy, resilient, zero carbon economies that create decent jobs, unlock inclusive and sustainable growth. That is the trans That transformation is well underway, but we all know it needs to go faster. So we must convert ambition to scaled action. This is what we're going to focus on in our sessions today that kick off a total of 10 sessions ranging right across industry um, throughout the day which we're running on behalf of the high level champions team in partnership as we said with the international trade unions congress please go to the forums or the UNFCCC's website um, to contribute debate and have your say on how we shape today and also during the session you can contribute through slido you will have seen the slide before with the link i hope many of you used your phones to connect but if not please go to slido um, and you can put your questions to the panel. Um, I would like to introduce our two high-level champions, Gonzalo uh, Minos, the uh, Chilean COP champion um, from Chile, and Nigel Topin, the UK's high-level climate action champion, um, representing the sort of UK's COP26 team. Gonzalo, over to you. Thank you very much, Anthony, and uh, and definitely welcome everyone to the second day of the Ready to See Your Dialogues. Uh, as, as Anthony well explained, we will focus today on the net zero transition in industry. Uh, first, on behalf of both Nigel and me, we want to say a big thank you to the World Economic Forum, the Mission Possible Platform, the International Trade Union Confederation, and all our incredible partners for bringing together leaders from industry, government, and civil society to mobilize action and accelerate the net zero industry trans transition. We, we know that we need to scale up commitments and keep up the momentum to maximize progress and tangible outcomes at COP26. What, what that means varies widely across different stakeholders within what we call industry. Goes from steel, aluminum and mining to apparel and fast moving consumer goods and across their scopes and different value chains. They all have unique challenges and opportunities on the path to net zero emissions. Thanks, Gonzalo. Um, I must just first thank you for getting up at silly o'clock. I don't know what time it is in, in, in Chile, but I, I feel like I have to get up early, but it's like four o'clock in the morning. So great, great, great to see you. And thanks, Anthony. And Wef, I, have, a, I, I hope no one from any of the other dialogue days is listening in because I have to admit this is my favourite day, having spent the first half of my career in industry. Um, so, a, a, as Gonzalo says, um, there's a real broad scope today. Um, but as well as those individual challenges of each sexual transformation, there are some really important points of interconnection where um, gains in one sector can have powerful ripple effects throughout all industries to accelerate our progress towards decarbonisation. In fact, I think we can see that. Some of these ripple effects are now becoming surges. Um, I think of some of the some of the technologies like storage or hydrogen, which cut across so many sectors. And I will be hearing about those. I mean, the, the purpose of our, our our morning briefings is to we want to try and frame the vision of the theme for the day. In this case, industry, drawing on the work that that um, you, Anthony, and your team, and, and everyone else in the Marrakesh Partnership community has been um, putting together on the climate action pathways to set out the blueprint for the vision with a particular emphasis, as you say, on the first steps, but also a clear sense of where we're going. I like to think of these visions as an exercise in rigorous imagination. I think that, that we often forget that imagination is the key tool in the engineer's toolkit. If we can't imagine something, then we can't build it. 
So let's 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 look back in 2050. In, in 2050, industries look very different to how they look now. They've gone beyond net zero emissions to become regenerative. They're delivering tangible social and economic and environmental benefits to the world at large, such as dignified employment, social inclusion, regeneration of nature, to name but a few. And no single factor can explain that radical transformation. This is systems transformation. It's the outcome of the accelerating feedback between multiple drivers of change. New technologies, of course, novel business models, progressive public policies, enlightened customer choices, forward thinking investment decisions, to name a few. Sure, and, um, and, 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 and getting that and connecting to also uh, what, what has been moving me during the, the last years, industrial production will, will, will follow a circular logic, then sees resources to be used again and again, and necessary waste will quickly become a thing of the past. As we say in three cycles, waste is an error of design that can and must be corrected. We will see, we'll talk about that during the day. The, the, the volume of natural resources used by industry will be well within planet capacity to, to replace. We will also see the rise of positive feedback loops, regulations, financial markets, and cost, cost, uh, consumer behaviors will be structured in such a way as uh, to reward those businesses that act responsibly. Climate action will definitely become a source of competitive advantage and data-driven transparency system will allow misaligned companies to be quickly identified. High carbon legacy firms will swiftly, definitely disappear. Yeah, and um, I mean, I just I just saw in the news today, I think a $600 million investment in a coal-fired power plant being, being, being written off. So it's a good example of high carbon legacy firms um, uh, being valued correctly. Um, and, and this is all part of placing our industrial system on a more socially responsible and environmentally sustainable footing. You could say this is as part of the, the, the revolution of purpose, which young engineers going to the workplace are demanding now. And it's uh, as we're already seeing it's a huge benefit for business competitiveness. And we know that in 2050, net zero companies um, will be the ones that have been resilient to the effects of climate change and natural disasters. Um, and those companies have gained considerable efficiency savings, lower costs, greater employee engagement, stronger brand loyalty, early access to new markets. In fact, that, 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 that's a list that echoes what um, a group of CEOs were telling the uh, UK Secretary of State, Alok Sharma, when they were talking to him on a round table a couple of weeks ago about the benefits they're already seeing and there's 30 years to go to 2050. Um, so these changes are definitely already happening as they've done in every industrial disruption in the past, the pace of change we know is always painfully slow at first, but then goes exponential. And this is the, this is the decade of exponential change where, where volumes go up, costs go down, actually in quite a predictable learning way, and transformations follow the S-curve through to full market adoption, faster than any incumbents ever predicted. And we'll be going, seeing sector after sector where the pace of change now is way faster than anyone predicted three years ago. And that's why we're so excited to be opening day two of the dialogues to hear um, under the expert curation of, um, of the Mission Possible platform, ETC, WEF and ITUC, hear about these new systems transformation from different perspectives so that we can um, learn what to expect in our collective race to the zero carbon economy of the 2040s. Great, Nigel and Gonzalo has an excellent segue um, into the amazing panel we have for you here. Um, and I think you, you pretty much described the sort of virtuous flywheel that we would like to talk about. So it, that flywheel is, is really starting to go. I'm going to dive in the interest of time. I'm going to dive straight in and introduce our panelists um, as, as I come to, to each of them. Um, to, to be honest, we, we have such a, a great uh, panel from across government, uh, civil society and industry. They probably need very little uh, introduction. First, uh, we have Sharon Burrow, General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, um, our partners uh, for the Industry Day today. Sharon, um, heavy industry supports millions of jobs and workers in these sectors we're talking about, um, and has and they've historically won, you know, af after you know a, a hard fight, good conditions via collective um, action, and. That could potentially be a barrier to the change we're talking about today. So how do we ensure that this is seen as a jobs-focused, just transition? 
with policies designed to trigger the shift to green industries, whilst at the same time ensuring decent work within them. So good morning, Anthony, and uh, indeed, thank you, Nigel and Gonzalo, for all the work you're doing to uh, manage uh, these discussions. But Mission uh, uh, 2020, of course, we are very grateful for <clears throat> the partnership because workers matter. Workers are at the centre of delivering the product that we're talking about. And uh, indeed, these industries hold very good jobs. They're very well unionised. They've often set the pace for the standards of uh, livelihoods, of safety, of the kind of, uh, you know, decent work that we talk about for every sector. If you look at uh, this industry, though, many of these uh, plants are actually also at the heart of communities, so they generate many other jobs. So they're vital to both the uh, workers and their families, to uh, communities, and, of course, to the nation's uh, that they serve either directly or indirectly through trade. But we take the view that every sector, every sector has to transition to give us a fighting chance to meet the net zero targets, but it must be a just transition. There's no doubt that if it's not based on social dialogue and agreement with workers, if it's not ambitious, and that means we're necessarily backed by government, then uh, this will actually risk jobs. Whereas if we make the transition, it will protect and potentially grow jobs into a, uh, into a, 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 you know, a uh, net zero economy. But we cannot stand back and allow these sectors not to transition because what that will mean, Anthony, is a steady decline. I must say that uh, the prevailing view in this industry, when I sat on the new climate economy, everybody knew you had to get to it. But there was a kind of prevailing view, it was in that other, too hard to address camp. Well, Mission Possible changed that. And it gave people like me and I know Nigel and you and others real heart that we could make this happen. So steel, aluminium, cement, think about those sectors. They're vital for construction, for transport, for manufacturing, and so much more. And now those industries themselves are actually demanding cleaner production. So it's not just the jobs in heavy manufacturing, it's the jobs in transport, in construction, in, ma in uh, cities and mass transit, in all of those areas, including services. And don't discount consumer choice. If the, if the, the construction sector says we want to build six, seven star buildings, then what is going to be the demand back into those heavy industries? If uh, mass transit in cities says we want to, uh, lighter and uh, greener um, construction for electric vehicles. What is the, uh, the prevailing uh, view going to be taken by those industries? So it will also take procurement rules, government, industry, to actually push the sectors to make it possible. I would simply say one thing, there is a big danger. As we crack the kind of, uh, the, if you like, the holy grail of why you need intensive heat for production in these sectors, then just be aware we cannot repeat the mistakes of the past. So an expansion of gas is short term because it will require the same transition. Dirty hydrogen is not the answer. So we have to get it right. And the only way we're going to get it right is everybody's at the table. It does uh, please me to see some industry sector consumer bodies are actually, uh, sorry, uh, employer bodies are actually there, but many aren't. And so we need to make sure that where that's the case, where you have leaders, those industries are protected as well. And it may require border adjustment strategies, but all of this will take dialogue and agreement. The message is we can and we must do this. Sharon, thank you so much. I mean, there's a lot we can do in industry to to show that this works and and to sort of demo, you know, to do systems demonstration and to push sort of early innovation. But the role of governments um, in in our virtuous flywheel is absolutely critical. Next, we have Isabella Lovin, um, the Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden and Minister for Environment and Climate. Um, Isabella, um, how can governments work in collaboration with industry to enable systems level transformation. Um, what is your experience? Sweden's a, a leader um, in, in this transition. 
in, in many, many ways. So what's your experience on the sort of the role of public private cooperation? Um, perhaps if we take the pioneering hybrid green steel um, project as, as one example, and the other, your leadership um, with, alongside India in the group, in the industry group for transition lead it. Um, well, well, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you to the World Economic Forum and Mission Possible for arranging these very important dialogues. And before I answer my, your question about uh, green steel and hybrid and uh, the, uh, the, the creation of, of real sustainable jobs in Sweden due to the green transition, I'd like to answer the question about how we can facilitate and, and make it possible with the green transition and create new jobs and make it a just transition. And I think the pathway forward is in three steps. First of all, you need clear policy, you need predictability. And in Sweden, we adopted a climate law in 2018. We have a broad majority in the Swedish parliament behind a climate uh, framework with uh, real um, accountability for each and every government up until 2045, where the Swedish parliament set a goal that Sweden should need reach net zero emissions by 2045. Now, the next step is, of course, uh, resources and financing. And uh, the Swedish government has allocated a lot of funding for the industry to make real technological leaps. We are a very, very uh, export dependent country and we have very many heavy industries, one being the steel industry. So by a financial co-financing mechanism called the industrial leap, we also provide support to these industries so they can really uh, contribute to our goal of getting to net zero emissions by 2045. And I get back to that. The third uh, pillar in this work is the public-private cooperation. And we created a platform called Fossil Free Sweden, where uh, sector by sector, uh, the Swedish um, uh, private sectors and also together with municipalities and the academic uh, world can work, work out roadmaps how to get to net zero emissions by 2045. Now, as a result of this work uh, and supported by these measures, one practical example uh, is the hybrid uh, project, which is, I think, uh, world leading uh, on producing fossil free steel by clean hydrogen, uh, not uh, the fossil one uh, that uh, Sharon mentioned, but really produced out of renewable energy. And this is really a, a paradigm shift for the steel industry. In Sweden, it accounts for 10% of our emissions. And now we already have a pilot plant uh, that is uh, built and already producing uh, clean steel up in the north of Sweden. And when I, I visited the north of Sweden, Luleå, and met with the workers there, they are so proud and they're so enthusiastic because they know that this is really securing their jobs for the future. And we're seeing a technological shift in steel manufacturing that is the first one, I would say, in a thousand years when you go from coal uh, in the uh, steel production to clean hydrogen. Now, on... So we need to really uh, share these principles and share these experiences internationally. So Sweden together with India is uh, working to, uh, with the platform called Leadit uh, that the WEF launched uh, last year and it convenes business leaders and uh, countries and ministers uh, to enable and transition of heavy industries to net zero emissions. The 1st of December, the group will have its second ministerial meeting where it will discuss meanings, uh, topics such as the sustainable and inclusive recovery after the COVID-19 crisis, uh, demand creation for public, for fossil, fossil free uh, industry and Sharon mentioned public procurement and I think this is a really important part of the green transition 
and last and but not least how to implement the industry transition through technology uh, finance and ndcs so what we want to see uh, for the world is the next hybrid it could be the cement industry aluminium many others that can be climate front runners so the time for action is now three things are needed we need policy frameworks we need supporting financing mechanisms and we need also platforms for sharing experiences and learning by doing and learning from each other with that i think we really can make this transition much faster than expected thank you thank you uh, deputy prime minister um now we're going to hear from industry. Um, we have Alan Knight, who is the Director for Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability at ArcelorMittal in the UK. Um, Alan, at ArcelorMittal, you've placed hydrogen at the core of your CO technology strategy um, in developing green steel solutions. And we've just heard about the importance of, of hydrogen. Can you tell us a bit more about the energy and technology pathways to get us to net zero in the steel sector? And what is needed in terms of policy and finance solutions to support that transition to drive green steel demand in Europe and beyond? Okay, thank you. So firstly, yes, we are, we see hydrogen as an important part of the solution uh, for steel making. Uh, both, you can apply it both to the blast furnace technology and the electric arc furnace technology using different types of ore. Um, but we also have other pathways as well. We're putting a lot of focus on um, carbon capture and storage. We're putting a lot of focus on carbon capture and utilization. In a world which doesn't use fossil fuels, um, there are materials such as ethanol, which also still need to be made and can be useful. You can actually convert waste um, greenhouse gases into those fuels using technology platforms we're building in Belgium and sort of linking into the fossil fuel or fossil free uh, technology platforms. Uh, we're also looking at using waste wood um, and waste plastics to, to displace some of our coal. Um, so yes, we do believe the long-term solution uh, includes hydrogen and hydrogen will be a big player. Of course, that has to be green hydrogen. That's already been said. We don't gain anything if we stick with um, grey hydrogen or, or natural gas, and we see that as very possible. But we also see these other technologies as, as important, uh, sort of the circular carbon principle. And, you know, there is a theoretical possibility that if we use biomass, if we can get that in the right, the right quantities from sustainable sources and we use storage, we can replicate the BEX model for energy, where we can actually even become carbon negative. Um, so... Yes, hydrogen is one pathway. There, there are many others. Um, but yes, we rely on access to new materials such as biomass. We rely on hydrogen. That hydrogen has to be green and competitive and other forms of renewable energy. Um, but for us, what, what we, we've got very confident in saying, we have high degrees of confidence that you can make steel without uh, carbon emissions. Um, it's how do you make that steel competitive, uh, in a world where we're competing with steel made, made in, say, let's say, the old-fashioned way. So those issues such as policy and finance, which others have already mentioned, are very front of mind with us. Thank you, Alan. And, and actually, maybe just to stick with you, because one of the questions that come in on Slido um, is, is to that very point. Um, people don't want to pay more. So how do we ensure that companies shift to sustainable products while keeping the prices low? So the first thing we need is we need um, carbon border adjustment, which is already being mentioned. We've got to find ways of making steel made the old fashioned way uh, unavailable. You know, at the moment, all the pressure on all the price on carbon is applied to steel made in Europe. It's not applied to steel used in Europe. So even the, 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 the carbon price is creating greater competitive opportunities for steel made abroad to be imported into Europe. So for us, the carbon border adjustment really matters. Um, obviously, access to, to low cost finance will, will help. Um, but when it comes to actually green still, I think, that, you know, there's a very important conversation still to be had about what, what is green still? Is it still made with zero carbon? Is it still 
based on some of these technologies. Are some of these technologies more green than other? So what is a green standard and how do you police it? Um, so I think yeah, that's a very interesting debate. We're working with Responsible Still, which is working on it, but other people need to work on it as well. Thank you, Alan. Well, that's a fantastic segue into our um, uh, final, but uh, certainly not least, um, panelist, Maria Mendelucci, the Chief Executive Officer of the We Mean Business Coalition. And Maria, I'm going to blend the question we gave you from, from a very similar question that's come in on um, Slido. So how can we ensure accountability and transparency necessary to ensure the commitments translated to real action? And what role do developments such as the task force and climate related financial disclosure, which interestingly the UK has just said they're going to make mandatory, um, and we, you know, that will we see a snowball um, in that regard? Um, and common metrics around ESG for consistent reporting of sustainable value creation. And the question that came in, which is, is very, um, if I can now find it on there, there's some great questions coming in, so please keep them, keep them coming, is, is along the lines of how, how, do we, um, how do we sort of hold companies to account? How do we ensure that they are really, that they're really accountable to the emissions reductions and the transition, and we're tracking their emissions? Maria. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Anthony. And thank you to the previous speakers with whom we're working really closely. So, um, so what, it, it was quite refreshing to, to hear from Alan the progress that it's being made. And uh, what we want to see is that uh, we track progress and on, on what the company is doing. And this will provide confidence, recognition and rewards by the financial markets. But let's uh, step back a little bit and, and summarize uh, the, the, the issue at stake. Um, we are currently on a race to zero, as uh, Nigel and Gonzalo has rightly uh, put it forward. In, within the Women Business Coalition, there are 1,400 companies that have committed to the Take Action uh, platform. 1,000 companies have committed to science-based targets. And uh, 1,200 companies are asking governments for the green recovery. In the meantime, uh, countries like Europe, China, Japan, South Korea, and soon the US have net zero targets. Uh, so what is the role of, uh, you know, we have all these uh, companies and countries setting up very ambitious targets, but then how do we track progress? Well, I think it all starts and the TCFD is an excellent framework for companies to follow. It's been already supported by 1,500 companies and 42 percent of those are implementing it. And the first start starts with understanding risk and opportunities and develop targets. And that's where the science-based targets initiative provides an, an excellent uh, tool for companies to, to project what they're going to do. Following that, they need to transform their strategies. We have heard about procurement practi practices. We have heard about investment in hydrogen, innovation, skills that will be required to develop these new strategies. The company needs to put that in place and then report progress and disclosure. So TCFD is an excellent mechanism. We're really glad to see the UK making it mandatory. We are asking governments and the Women Business Coalition that this should be mandatory and so that we can create a level playing field because investors need to have visibility on company actions on the risk and opportunities and, and track how they are advancing. And we think that it's very important to establish a dialogue between industry and investors. The World Business Council for Sustainable Development is doing this in depth in different sectors. And this um, allows the, the both groups to, to create a, a common language, as you said before, because we are talking about complex issues that, um, that some of the investors are, do not have the technical knowledge, etc. So they're for it's really important um, to, well, to, pro to provide the, the tools and the frameworks for them to have this dialogue. Excellent progress being made increasingly by companies from all the sectors, from the power sector with Iberdrola, Lafarge, Solsim, Nestle, Volkswagen, Shell, or BASF. So I think, um, well, TCFD is, is here to stay, but we need to more work much more to build scenarios, create the common metrics and integrate climate change into risk management. So definitely coming to your question, this is the way uh, to ensure that there is transparency and accountability. Thank you, Anthony. Maria, thank you so much. Um, 
Deputy Prime Minister, there's, I saw your um, tweet and like many in the world, you were welcoming the, uh, the President-elect Biden. Um, we have a question that has come in. Is how will the election of um, President-elect Biden change the progress towards the Paris Agreement? Thank you. Um, no, I think it will have really a huge impact on the climate work and our cooperation ahead. I think with two perspectives, one the international one. Uh, the president-elect uh, Joe Biden, he said that uh, within the first hundred days of his presidency, he would uh, sum up for a uh, summit uh, for the countries that uh, are responsible for the biggest uh, emissions in the world. So that's a really uh, powerful sign that the US wants to be a leader again on uh, the, the fight against climate change. He personally is also very, very much engaged uh, and was, I think, one of the first uh, senators to put forward a, a, a climate law in, this, in the US uh, Congress. Um, and uh, the second of course, very important uh, arena for him, for the new uh, administration to work is uh, uh, nationally in the USA. And uh, he has quite some ambitious targets uh, to defossilize the um, electric sector by 2035, uh, to put very stringent restrictions on the emissions uh, allowed by cars, so to allow for electrification of the um, car sector uh, very swiftly. Uh, also, he's uh, been very um, outspoken about wanting to abolish subsidies to going to, to fossil fuels uh, and uh, also protecting the Arctic and, and uh, really the public uh, ground that is, um, would, would not be any more open to more explore, uh, exploitation when it comes to fossil fuels. Uh, so it's really, I think, the, the, um, the message going to the private sector and to the financing sector it will be very, very clear that there will be a boom in renewable energy and going over to new technologies uh, and the US market is very big. And also that uh, there will be huge support for the international work, both when looking at ODA, looking at uh, how to uh, support the developing countries to go to uh, renewable energy and, and do a green recovery after the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and also the, the carbon adjustment uh, mechanism that was mentioned earlier on. I think uh, Joe Biden also has talked about that and how to use trade measures to accelerate the, the, the transition. Thank you. Uh, I'm, go I'm going to take it now to, to Sharon. Um, and, and in a sense, building on that question and also another question is coming about China. Um, but what, what we, the, the appeal of, of, of certain more populist politicians and, and leaders um, has been perhaps coming from sectors of society who fear for their future and jobs um, and, and well-being, and they perhaps looked to um, more populist um, leaders. And, and, and whichever way we look at it, um, President Trump still garnered a lot of a lot of uh, votes um, in the presidential election. How can this transition really reassure? those sectors of society who feel excluded, feel threatened. Um, can we build a narrative of hope around the future and around jobs and around their, their well-being and security of their families? So Anthony, that's the core of it. We have to build not just a narrative, but we have to include people everywhere in their future. That's what Just Transition's about. If you ask a worker what they want today, what they want is a job, a good job where they can, you know, look after themselves and their families and, and have some hope for the future. And when you see transition to the past and communities decimated by previous industrial transitions that were anything but just, then you understand the anger. 
when nobody talks to people who uh, are in vulnerable sectors that must transition, then of course you're going to get anger. So that's why we say dialogue, just transition measures are very simple. They're about secure pensions, secure uh, uh, bridges to pensions for older workers who make that choice. You know, a guarantee of jobs where we can and skills and redeployment with income support where we can't. And of course, underpinning that has to be the uh, secure universal social protection that is so vital. So it's all about security. And I wanted to come back to a point that um, Deputy uh, um, uh, Prime Minister Lovin made about, in fact, uh, pride, where workers see their jobs are secure, where they, they are working with the companies to make the transition. And remember, their knowledge is extraordinary. They can tell you often more about the production base than uh, most of the executives. So, you know, where they have that pride because they're involved, it's an amazing thing to watch. And tomorrow afternoon, I think there's a union panel where the steel uh, transition in Sweden with our deputy president and indeed uh, the, uh, the CEO of the steel company will be featured. But the other thing that we heard was about circular production. This generates more jobs and that will give workers more security. You know, I'm constantly impressed by cement companies. Again, everybody said that cement's just dirty. You can't have clean cement. That's an oxymoron. Well, not true. If you go to Damir in India and look at their, not just cleaning up the cement process, but actually looking at circular CCU, which we support, you know, absolutely carbon capture and usage for other areas of production, like organic fertilizer, um, carbon rods, which have the strength of steel, all of those uh, possible technologies, we can do this but we must have governments on side. And that's why the US election has a lot of hope. Now, you know, uh, the new president will have to be courageous, but the unions will work alongside of him. They'll have workers support where you can see the trust in the future. And that means jobs and security. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. In a moment, I'm gonna to come to Maria and, and talk about the, the road to COP and, and the possibility of delivering sectoral agreements across industry, but, but first, um, I want to bring in both Alan um, and Deputy Prime Minister Lovin, um, because a lot of questions, and I'm, 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 my apologise to those who are putting them in on, on finance, but I'm going to try and sort of synthesise the various questions um, on finance. So clearly a lot of interest in how we finance the, tr the transition from early stage technologies through the sort of the, that sort of classical valley of, of death where you, you've got a technology, but it, it's still perhaps not able to provide the returns to the private sector um, needed to, to when that comes out the other end and you can scale technologies. We've seen much of this with clean energy, wind and solar and now batteries and electric vehicles. So how do you both see that transition? And I think particularly, I think, you know, what, what's really come out of a lot of the workshops we've been running under Mission Possible as part of our um, uh, transition finance initiative where we've been bringing the financial institutions together with the the industries to, to talk about this and map out where where you need the financing what the risk profiles are how you develop the sort of right financing products to, to do that is that the policy framework's really important and there's a critical role for public finance and private finance and, and the blending of the, the two so perhaps maybe start with Alan you know mm. what are the challenges you face as a company in financing these new technologies from pilot plants through to scale up and then perhaps um, Deputy Prime Minister Lovin we can talk about you know how, how do governments support that but not in, in in the right policy frameworks that give finance confidence but also before technologies um, are able to produce the sort of the sort of returns that are looked for maybe alan yeah so when i talk to our finance people you know they they would say you know we have lots of choices in how we can raise finance for our business um but what we need first is the business case to actually make those sorts of investment um and so we very quickly look back into the the the, the policy challenges about are we making steel which will compete in a marketplace where steel is still being made in the old fashioned way? Is there a return on this investment? Um, so, so the obvious answer is still true. It, it depends on the business case and the policy. But yes, of course, 
access to finance at a lower cost uh, or designed to help us. So transition bonds, green bonds, grants, <laughs> free money, you know, they all help. Um, and we're seeing them emerge. We, you know, there's the innovation fund in the EU, which we've applied for some of our projects for, you know, for low cost money or free money to do it. But ultimately, it goes back to what you've heard already in this event. Many people already know it's the policy. It's the market confidence that's still made with new technology, with more expensive operating costs can compete in a world where still is being made the old fashioned way. So. So the business case for the for those investments is, is paramount. Lower cost investments of um, funding, of course, is fantastic, but we need the business case fundamentally. Alan, thank you. And mm -hmm. you know, um, Deputy Prime Minister, I mean, Alan, maybe tongue in cheek, talks about free money, but it's not free money, is it? I mean, it, it, it's it's public money. But as we as we have seen, as we have seen, um, deployed effectively it can make a huge difference I mean, we, we can produce we've seen this with wind and solar now that you know so you don't need that support forever you just need that support to scale the technologies to the point where they're cost competitive if not cheaper and better than the incumbent technology so what, what lessons mm -hmm. do you think we've learned from deploying those policies in relation to renewable energy and now batteries and electric vehicles that we can apply um, in the industry transition well, I think we, we can learn a lot from that. Uh, I think the EU has a lot of uh, policies that uh, relates to the emission trading scheme where the best available technology sets the benchmark and then you have to pay if you pay for your emissions if you, you don't apply the best uh, available technique. And I think uh, that could be a very, very interesting mechanism uh, uh, for instance, if we're looking at green steel production, if that sets the ben benchmark uh, in, in a future reform of the ETS. Well, from the Swedish government side, we uh, a few years ago, as I said, we launched this um, co-financing scheme called the Industrial Leap, where we're targeting the uh, in industry sectors that really need to have a technology technological uh, transition they just can't uh, kind of uh, go the energy efficiency way but have to find new uh, processes in order to produce for instance cement and steel uh, and we're we're co-financing these very heavy uh, uh, investments that needs to be done and i think for most industries it's not possible to do that um, in the initial stage and this has really started a lot of uh, activity in Sweden. And now we added uh, to that um, possibility of co-financing also green um, credit guarantees from the, from the state. So the next three years, uh, some five equivalent to 5 billion euros uh, in green uh, credit guarantees from the state, we, we issued that so that the uh, all the sectors that need to make this transition also can can have uh, credits uh, in with fa favorable terms where the uh, state takes uh, takes the risk and i think that is a very small risk because we know, all know that the the climate risks uh, are much much bigger as has been pointed out uh, so this is rather an opportunity but also, the financial uh, institutions need to, to weigh in the, the climate risk. Um, but for the in this tra transitional time, uh, the state wants to take and lift off that risk. Thank you. Thank you both. I mean, the, the way you have both described and articulated the way industry and government can work together, you know, fills me, me with hope. Um, Maria, there's other ways in which business and government and civil society can work together over the next 12 months. Um, and that's to deliver sectoral agreements. You know, again, rather tongue in cheek, we, we say that industry is not a, the business world is not a side event. It's obviously, uh, the real economy is not a side event. Um, it, it's critical that the real economy is engaged in the climate discussions and negotiations because it's the real economy that will have to deliver the emissions uh, reductions. Um, one of the objectives, you know, working with We Mean Business and working with our partners, the Energy Transitions Commission and RMI and WBCSD and, all, and, and, and many of the other organizations in this space that we, that we have, is alongside the high level champions to see if we can deliver sectoral agreements to bring some of the most fastest moving governments with the fastest moving 
companies in each sector to, to set the bar high on industry transition. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about that process and what might be possible um, in Glasgow uh, 12 months from now. Thank you. So I think we're very excited to, to, to work with you, Anthony, on the Mission Possible platform. We were developing roadmaps for seven, eight uh, critical sectors that need um, radical uh, collaboration to advance um, on the decarbonization plans. I think uh, what we can deliver in, in Glasgow, it's a very solid proposal for, from these industry groups that are led by the CEOs of these companies about what the, the industry can do to accelerate the demand uh, for clean products in those sectors, how um, the sector can work with the, uh, with the investors and the finance sector to unlock some of the barriers, and very importantly, uh, the dialogue with policymakers uh, on creating these enabling fr frameworks that are tailored to the sectors is extremely important. We have heard about carbon pricing, uh, broader tax adjustments. I think um, some of the technologies that are needed in, in these sectors require some of the risking, and that's really interesting what Sweden is doing there. And we need to just scale this across the globe. Mandatory reporting will be very important and, um, and, and having a sectoral approach that is global will help enormously uh, companies in these sectors because uh, we need to have a common rules. We need to have a long-term vision but common rules across the globe so that com uh, companies can scale the solutions and don't have to tailor the solutions to different uh, country regulations. So that uh, requires uh, incredible innovation in terms of uh, collaboration uh, and, and very much needed because the we need to accelerate the deployment of certain technologies that do not belong to a particular sector as well, and like hydrogen, for example. And I think, um, yeah, it's going to be super exciting to work on the Mission Possible platform. I think, yeah, watch the space. And, yeah, we're going to deliver great things for COP. Thank you. Yes, and we have some exciting news to come, hopefully, in the next uh, few days uh, in that regard. Well, like always, when you're having fun, um, time flies, and we're, we're, we're a little bit over time. So I'm going to encourage um, closing remarks from our panelists in, in, in one sentence with one sort of key word, perhaps that um, that is really resonating with you right now after this uh, after this discussion. Um, Sharon, you can set the bar high here. Okay, so sector agreements, big tick, and they're urgent, but don't leave workers out. You won't build the trust if the unions are not at the table with industry, with government. We want to make this possible. It's mission possible, but it's mission urgent. And I assure you, we do all of our own stunts, no stunt men used here. <laughs> um, social media is, is going wild right now, so please continue to, to do that um, with the hashtag race to zero. Um, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, love him. Thank you for that challenge. Uh, I think Sharon uh, um, expressed it very uh, well. And I, I think uh, besides the cooperation uh, aspect of this, we also need leadership. So I think uh, we want to invite more uh, stakeholders to join the Lead It initiative, the Mission Possible, and show the way. And I'd also like to mention that in 2022, Sweden is... Uh, going to host a UN conference uh, on the environment, uh, which is the 50th anniversary of the first ever conference on the environment held in Stockholm in 1972. And I think we can show more leadership there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's, that's very exciting. Um, Alan, what, what's your final word to our audience? I would say uh, zero low carbon steel making is technically possible uh, and can happen, but it needs good policy and effective green standards to make competitive. Wonderful. Thank you, Alan. Um, and Maria, um, particularly in light of, of the movements we are seeing with, with China, with Japan, with South Korea following on the heels of countries like the UK and Ireland and others making net zero commitments, and many of the corporate net zero commitments that we're we now seeing. 
um, under the, the Race to Zero umbrella as part of the World Economic Forum's Net Zero Challenge. Um, how, how, how do we sort of capture all that ambition and, and really deliver um, something pretty spectacular next year in Glasgow? Well, I think um, the key word for me is hope. So if, you, if we spoke to many of the people in this panel 10 days ago, I mean, the outlook was quite negative with coronavirus hitting really hard with the US election showing a lot of doubt and uncertainty. And, and, and this week, every day, we have had a positive news that gives us hope that we can mobilize to solve the biggest challenge that we face, which is the pandemic and the climate change. Obviously, we want to solve this because, uh, because this is good for the planet, but it's very good for the people. And so I couldn't agree more with the previous speakers that the people need to be at the center and the people are going to be the ones that are going to help us uh, drive this forward. There is an incredible momentum uh, that is built now uh, where you have the private sector and the key in countries that are pushing in that direction. And that requires a lot of dialogue a dialogue so that we create the rules and, and, the, and the frameworks that will allow us to capitalize on this momentum. So I think the work that Anthony, that you're doing and, the, and Nigel and Gonzalo are doing with the Race to Zero Dialogues, it's a very important uh, moment. I think we want to have more policymakers. Uh, we want to have Sweden uh, always present, but more countries in these dialogues because we need to talk much more to each other to accelerate uh, and to deliver results in, in, the, in this decisive decade. Thank you. Maria, thank you very much. Um, if you've enjoyed this conversation um, and this debate um, and discussion, there's plenty more uh, where this came from today with our 10 sessions. So you can find out more about all of those sessions on the UNFCCC website, and also on the World Economic Forum's website. If you want to see more or find out more about the work that the Mission Possible platform is doing, again, please go to the Mission Possible platform website where you'll be able to find details of, of our initiatives across the seven sectors. So aluminium, um, heavy chemicals, cement, steel, um, aviation, shipping, trucking, um, and also some of the cross-cutting work we're now doing in finance, in policy, on hydrogen, on circular cars. Um, it, it's incredibly uh, important work, um, and it's absolutely critical, where we're really bringing some of the, the leading companies, the fast movers, that those who really get it and know that they need to be part of the transition um, with governments um, and with civil society to, to make this uh, transition happen. Um, and I would like to, to thank all of our panelists who've been great supporters of the work um, that we're doing, along with our partners at the Energy Transitions Commission. Um, and we're really looking forward to working much more closely with We Mean Business as well under the leadership of Maria, which we're very, very excited um, about. So thank you, Sharon, and to the uh, International Trade Union Confederation for supporting and being our partner um, today um, with the industry Race to Zero Dialogues. Thank you so much, um, Isabel Loving, Deputy Prime Minister uh, of Sweden, and, and for all your support, um, both with Mission Possible and the, and the Lead It Group. Um, thank you, Alan Knight, um, and to your company, Aspen Patel, for the great work and being leaders um, in, in this transition. Um, and Maria, thank you as well. And obviously our high-level champions, uh, Gonzalo and Nigel, have gone on to other uh, events, but we would like to thank them for um, inviting us, uh, both ITUC and the World Economic Forum to put on this day. Um, there's also the Transport Day tomorrow and the Oceans Day um, after the day after, which we are also uh, leading on, which I hope many of you will find um, interesting. But I would like to close today's session, um, thank our panelists and thank all of you um, who have taken part all of you who have been sharing um, on social media um, and also for submitting your questions through Slido. That's really contributed, I think, to the richness um, of the conversation um, and the debate today. Thank you. <laughs>